been thinking the past few days about the issue of identity. It's huge in our culture right now. If you're a fan of Mad Men, you know that the protagonist Gregor's major issue, especially at the end, was who am I? It was an issue of identity. A part of what's going on in the midst of the incredible confusion of our present political campaigns around the presidency is about what's called identity politics. In other words, each candidate trying to reach out to a certain segment of the voting population and to use buzzwords, phrases, and the like that in essence communicates to a certain group, I'm one of you, therefore you should elect me. And because we are in this kind of fractured state, it reflects something that's going on in our culture. We're, we're adrift in some ways. We're not clear as a nation, as we might have been in other times, about what it actually means, what is the identity of what it means to be American. And because that's right now something that's really up for grabs. You have different political candidates laying out very different agendas from each other, not just as a matter of policy, but more importantly than that, as a matter of identity. In other words, they're not just trying to find a certain platform. They're actually trying to shape who we are. They're trying to be on the forefront of saying, look at me, this is where I would like us to take the country. That's much different than saying, these are my policies, vote for me. I think about that around now because right here in this service, the question, the issue, the theme of a service of baptism and confirmation is identity. Because an identity is being imparted this morning. Something is about to change in a very significant way in the life of these people who are being presented. It's not just a question of going through a particular ritual. It's not even just in some kind of deeper affirmation. It has to do with their identity, who they are, how they define themselves, how we define each other as Christian people. All of that's very, very important. It hit me actually a news as I was getting ready for it because I grew up in the South. And that there is, there is an identity ritual, if you're a Southern, around what you eat on New Year's Day. <laughs> you get that, right? I didn't know, even though I'd grown up in this, I didn't know how important it was until I'm in my early 20s, single, in a car, driving through the deep south on my way, I think, to Texas. And I stopped and visited my mother's sister, my aunt, who lives in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And it was maybe the 2nd of January, and I go in, I get there about 6 o'clock. We're sitting in the kitchen talking because I should be talking in front of the South and your, your family. And she, in the midst of that conversation, said, have you had your black eyed peas and greens yet? <laughs> and I said, no. She was hard. <laughs> she immediately got up from the table, went to the refrigerator, pulled out what they had on New Year's Day, heated some up, put it on the table, and said, here, eat. It was a command, not a suggestion. <laughs> now, some of that, of course, is superstition. And I don't, I don't buy the superstition. But I want you to know that I've had Hop and John and Greens every New Year's Day since then, <laughs> including just a few days ago. You see, that's identity. Doing things like that expresses a part of who we are that we think is important. It's about how we define ourselves. If you were of a certain age in the South, they wouldn't care where you were in school. They'd want to know, what's the question? Who are your people? Because that was the way of identifying, identifying those, who you are. Now it's more about, or where'd you go to college, or where'd you grow up, or what do you do for a living? Or they size you up according to the kind of clothes that you have on, because particularly in this culture where identity is such a wide open question, Clothing has become a new way of defending, defining your own tribal identity. Whether, that is, whether those are skinny jeans, or whether it's a certain kind of tattoo that you have on, or a Lacoste ice on shirt, you fill in the blank what it is. Depending on your tribe, that's who you identify with in 
the midst of lots of fashion choices. We're looking for something in all of those ways. But to be a Christian, how does that define your identity? Quite honestly, it depends on what you think a Christian is. If you ask a lot of people what a Christian is, uh, they might say something pretty pejorative. Oh, I know who you Christians are. You're, you're, the, you're the ones who, date, who go to church but hate people who aren't like you. Yeah. I've had that said to me. Or it could be something to the effect of, oh, you know, it's like the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's what it means. It, at least to be Christian. I'm not so sure about, you know, maybe. Is that right? People have all kinds of ideas about what it is or is not to be a Christian. The phrase I want to hone in on that I think is so succinct is the phrase in the collect this morning, the prayer that I prayed at the beginning of the service after we finished the early part of the liturgy. Grant that we may notice the phrase, share the divine life of Him, who the Him is, is Jesus. In other words, what is a Christian? A Christian is not merely somebody who believes a certain way Although that's true, it's not merely somebody who practices certain rituals like what we're about to do, although it is that. But it's much more deeper. It's actually organic. It's visceral. It's that somehow, by a miracle that we do not deserve, God chooses out of His wonders and great love to literally pour Himself into our very being, into the depths of who we are. It, it's not just you see a question of God with us, as in standing beside us, although His presence fills the whole world, or over us, and instead it's God here, in my chest, in the deepest part of your very being. God has chosen, if you belong to Jesus Christ, to put the deepest, in the deepest part of who you are, His own nature. Grant that we may share the divine life of Him, meaning Jesus, who humbled Himself to share our humanity. That's what it means to be a Christian. And therefore, the call in this Sunday, especially in the vows that are being taken, both for the first time for some, but for many of the rest of us, we are reaffirming is to say, how does the rest of my life line up with what it means to identify myself because of the gift of God as one who shares the divine life of Jesus? And how does that affect how I think politically? How does that affect the way I spend my money and how I order my time? How does that affect the way I deal with human relationships? I mean, I, I thought about it even in terms of when I came into church and sat down. If you understand you yourself as one who shares the divine life of Jesus, you're here for one reason and then other things that crowd around it. The one reason is that you're here to focus in on and to worship and to spend time in the presence of God. To be with Him. To honor Him as best you can in your words and the commitments that you make in the context of the service, to receive a new dose of that divine life as you receive the Eucharist, to rejoice as those who are receiving a new bit of that divine life through baptism and confirmation. In other words, it's the presence of Jesus that really makes this worthwhile. And you're saying, as worshipers, I'm stepping in. I'm here to be in the presence of Jesus. The, the Jews, the Orthodox Jews, have this wondrous thing that they do at the Western Wall. I don't know that if you've ever noticed it. What an Orthodox Jew will do if he is preparing his plan is that if this is the wall and he's right here, you'll see him do this, and it's preparation. And then all of a sudden, after he's prepared, he steps in. That's what we're doing here. We're stepping in. We're choosing to say, we're choosing to say, as someone who shares the divine life of Jesus, I'm stepping into his presence. And this is my time to be here. Now, if that's not how you think about it, what are you going to do instead? Well, what you're going to do is gossip and be critical. Right? 
sit down and hear, oh, look who's here. Or the music won't be to your liking, no present company excluded. <laughs> so you're going to be critical in your brain about how the music didn't go the way you liked it. In other words, what's going to happen is, and I can keep going with examples, you will approach worship as a consumer in the very same way that you will approach a movie or a dinner, restaurant. In other words, it's all about you, as the advertisers say again and again and again. That's not sharing the divine life of him who's yielded his life for us. No, no, you're here to be in the presence. And that doesn't mean that we shouldn't do things well. I, I'm not against excellence. It has everything instead to do with focus. Why are you here? And then out of that, thinking about not just what happens within the context of church, but also about how one orders one's life. Because it's actually running against the grain to order your life around this kind of identity that is far deeper than any other expression of identity, whether that's regionalism or race or educational background, who you know, your business, what you've done financially, all those other things that we use to identify ourselves and form our identity, this is deeper than that. Notice even in the Gospel reading, the whole family has come up for this big huge occasion, this festival, does it? We don't know what festival it is. And they're all there. Jesus is with them. He's 12 years old, and that's important because he is bar mitzvah age. He has been received. Otherwise, he wouldn't sit with the elders as he does. And so what's going on is they've all experienced the festival. It's been wonderful. They go home. But then he's not there. That wouldn't happen with us. We panic if our 12-year-old was gone for an hour at the mall, and we don't know where he or she is. But if they had a different culture, they just assumed that Jesus was some, with some other member of the family or friends, as it says. So they are literally 24 hours after he's gone missing that they finally trace their way back, make their way into the temple, and here's Jesus, and he's sitting with the rabbis. He's talking to the owners, and they're literally having talking religion, and he's talking to them as a peer, which they find astonishing coming from a 12-year-old. And what does Jesus say to his parents? When they say, terrified as any parent could be, where have you been? Probably just like that. And he says to them, didn't you know that I would be in my father's house? That's, that's a shocking thing for him to say. What's he doing? He's actually operating out of an identity. <coughs> that's deeper than his relationship with his parents. He is being who he is as Son of God. Jesus knew who he was. When you make the decision to begin to operate out of identity that is deeper than all of those identities, what happens is, is that you begin to call the validity of some of those other identities into question. For example, as someone who grew up in the South, I grew up in a caste system that very much defined people in lots of ways according to family background or other different kinds of things. We, we say, uh, in Christ, those things don't matter anymore. We're one. And there's no such thing as second class citizens. Oh, you're, 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 you're new into the Episcopal Church, aren't you? I was born in a Episcopal. <laughs> no, no, no. See, see, that's the old. That's a culture that is actually in contradiction to a culture that's based on sharing the divine life. And there are all kinds of subtle ways we can pull right with one another, and all it does is foster a kind of internal angry competitiveness, a resentment that boils in up just underneath the surface between the ins and the outs. To be in Christ and to define my identity as one who shares the divine life of him who humbled himself asks entirely different things of you than entering into that kind of competitive environment of some of us are more equal than others. It is the mark of our culture. 
It should not be the mark of believers in Jesus Christ. So today, on this first day of the new year, where many of our friends and colleagues are thinking about New Year's resolutions, I would urge you to begin to make some time to think about your life, about how you express what is important to you, around what about that reflects this deep identity as one who has been, by baptism, grafted in, sharing the divine life of him who humbled himself to share our humanity. Because whether you actually like it or not, that's what you've committed yourself to. That's what's going to show up, as it were, in the baptismal promises that you make. All of those phrases that are profoundly important express a life that is based on this identity even if it places us in opposition to some other identities, perhaps even ones we hold dear. One last thing. You will notice, and I've already warned those being confirmed, that I will do three things in terms of my hand motions, all of which are symbolic. I'm sure you all know this, my old friend of Episcopalians. Gestures are never gestures in the liturgy. They're always meant to represent something else. And so they will come and they will kneel or stand as they're able. And I will do three things. Hand on their head. That's a prayer for God's protection. Secondly, a little oil on my thumb right there. Sign of the cross. A reminder of their baptism. But also oil in the scriptures, both Old and New Testament, always represents the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God coming and moving in. And so we're praying for the Holy Spirit to touch The third thing that I will do is this. Now, it won't be that loud. That was just for effect. But I want you to know that the little slap on the cheek, while both an ancient part of confirmation, is a symbol of a commitment to serve Jesus, even if it's difficult. Even if it costs you something. Even if it puts you in conflict with other parts of your family, your friends, or your culture. Because to be a Christian by its very nature is both comforting and disruptive all at the same time, as it should be. Because you're calling Jesus Lord, and that means you're submitting your life to Him. And since you and I love to be in charge, that's not always easy, is it not? Nod your head. If you don't know the conflict, I'm not sure you know a lot about the Lordship of Jesus. So as we enter into this part of the service together, I would invite you to think carefully about what you're committing to. God takes your promises very seriously. Don't lie just to look good. But instead, make this decision as we walk into this together to say, I'm finding and I'm asking God's help to do it, to find a deeper way to step into this new identity that in fact is mine in Christ. And I yield, God help me, I yield to His authority. That He might be Lord. And I might be little less of a liar about who I am and be more truthful about who's in me and who owns me as a member of his body.